This meeting is being recorded. Hello and welcome. We are here today for our monthly seminar. And with us once again is Darren Hardison. Darren, my right arm, colleague of many years, financial planner, life insurance underwriter, and overall good person. Today's topic is going to be the use of life insurance in funding a buy-sell agreement, which is of critical appeal to our audience members who do run businesses, who do have partners, and also to advisors, accountants, coaches, attorneys who advise business owners on their business and financial planning. So, Darren, let us begin. Um, when we talk about using life insurance to fund a partnership agreement, let's start with saying, what exactly is a partnership agreement? Um, it's interesting. And good morning, everybody. It's it's interesting in that it can mean different things uh, to different people in in different circumstances. So oftentimes, um, you know, we'll be introduced to a new business, um, to new clients, and they'll say, I need life insurance uh, to, to fund uh, my business. And sometimes it's, it's you know, it's, it's fact finding. It's, well, what's the ultimate purpose? And to your point is, um, you know, there's a, there's a formal, you know, business agreement, meaning if this happens, uh, if one of the partners dies, then the surviving partner, you know, buys their interest, um, from their family. Um, it doesn't have to be a formal business arrangement, meaning an attorney doesn't have to dry up, uh, draw up a formal buy-sell agreement. It can just be uh, their mutual agreement, their understanding of, of what they want to happen. And I always remind people, life insurance really is nothing more uh, than the funding to satisfy whatever their agreement is. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So let's take a look at the flow of a business. So we have Mo and Larry who are business partners and they're each married and, and unfortunately Mo dies. Mm -hmm. So what happens to his share of the business? Um, well, to, to scoot back a second. So the way we would structure that is um, let's just say for easy math, uh, they each established uh, based on their ownership interest in the company and the company valuation. Um, they each need a million dollar policy. So typically in that arrangement, each partner would own the other's uh, life insurance policy. So they, you know, they could be sure that the policy stayed in force. And, um, uh, you know, the surviving partner would be the beneficiary. The surviving partner would then use those proceeds uh, to pay assuming the person's married, Mo's married, to, to, to buy that million dollars of business interest uh, from, the, from the spouse. Okay, so Mo unfortunately has passed away mm -hmm. and his share of the business has passed to his spouse mm -hmm. who has four kids, doesn't know the business, wants to be with the kids and, be in, and, and, and help the family go through this transition. So she has shares of a business that she doesn't want, but she wants money. So as you just described, um, Larry had been holding a million dollar policy on Mo. So Larry's now the beneficiary of that million dollar policy, right? Yeah. So, so what happens? So Larry has the money and Mrs. Mo has the shares of the business. So what do they do? They make a trade? Yeah, in essence, again, that's it, it's really satisfying both parties. It protects the wife in that uh, she doesn't have to become involved in a business that she probably doesn't know anything about. So she doesn't have the skill set to to go in and and you know add value the way her husband did. Um, so in essence, you know, she would be holding uh, you know a million dollars of equity in a company that she knows nothing about. Likewise, uh, their surviving partner, um, I, I'm always delicate when I say this, uh, he doesn't necessarily want uh, uh, a spouse who has no, no knowledge of the business to come in and be his 50% partner. Uh, nothing against the spouse, it's just she doesn't you know, have the necessary skill set. So in essence, it's, 
you know, in essence, a, a, a pre a pre uh, designed exit strategy where the wife says, "Hey, I, I give me my million dollars um, per the uh, the buy sell arrangement, whether it's formal or, or informal. That that share that fifty percent share of the deceased owner uh, now goes to their surviving owner." Okay, so everybody then is made whole. She has what she wants, which is just money to take care of her family. He has what he wants, which is now the shares of the business. He has his shares and he has the shares of his deceased partner. Yeah. Okay. So, so what would happen if um, they got so busy with their business as people do and they neglected to take out life insurance on one another? Still, we have the situation of Mrs. Mo having sh half the shares of the business, mm -hmm. but Larry doesn't have a million dollars of life insurance benefit. So what does he do? Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we've seen that and it's, uh, it's, it's just not pretty. I mean, then you, you've got uh, a lot of, a lot of resentment and, uh, um, you know, a situation where, the, you know, the, the business is disrupted regardless, even with the life insurance, you know, there's going to be an adjustment period for the business to, you know, kind of, to kind of get settled with, with the surviving partner. Um, but without that liquidity to satisfy uh, the spouse, and then, you know, the spouse typically is, is going to want to get involved in the business to be sure, you know, that, that at least she's able to derive some sort of income stream from it. It's just, it's just hard because that's, as you know, business is hard enough when things are going smoothly. And when you throw a, a wrench into the machine like that, um, it just, it, it's chaos. I guess a little chaotic would be the best way to explain it. Chaos is a good word. Um, yeah. Of course, if, if they had, if, if Larry had a million dollars in retained earnings, you know, he, he, he could gut that, but then yeah. that's going to cripple the business's liquidity. Um, I'm sure there's other things that he would rather be doing with a million dollars available in cash in his business besides paying off the grieving widow of his former partner. But, but if they did have an agreement, he's going to have to do it. Otherwise it sounds like she would have grounds to sue him. And yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of smaller businesses, I mean, frankly, um, you know, they can't afford to, to have a, a huge amount of, of retained earnings. They, are using their capital to, to grow, to buy new equipment, to buy, you know, new space or, you know, whatever the nature of their business is. Um, I mean, frankly, it's not really efficient to keep an inordinate amount of, uh, you know, cash on hand. So the life insurance is a very uh, inexpensive, comparatively inexpensive way just to, you know, to diffuse that, you know, possible situation. No, for sure it is. All right, let's let's assume now that they believe in life insurance. And they understand that it's it's a financially very efficient way of funding the agreement. But let's suppose um, Mo is a an older person with diabetes and a heart history, and Larry is a much younger, healthy guy. Um, do you, is would life insurance still be an option for these guys? Yeah, I mean, typically, um, again, you you pay, uh, you know, pay a, a premium commensurate with with your age and your medical history. Um, so even if if two individuals are healthy, as you know, you pay you pay more, you know, based on your age, just actuarially, um, you know, with with impaired risk or medical history. Um, again, one of one of our sweet spots, one of our specialties with with my underwriting background. Um, yeah, then it's, you know, we go back to our pre-qualification that we always talk about and get the, you know, get the person pre-qualified before we have them jump through too many hurdles. And in getting pre-qualified, they're able to understand what the rate structure would be even before they apply. So, so, I mean, it's only natural. I mean, partners want there to be some kind of equality. So in this scenario with, with Mo being older, having some existing medical conditions and Larry being younger and healthy, it's safe to say that for the same amount of insurance, for the same coverage period, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is, um, the premium is going to be much higher for Mo than it is for Larry. So 
do they have any recourse? How do business partners typically resolve that that inequality between the premium expenditures? Do you have any idea, any experience with that? Yeah, I mean, what I was going to say before is, I mean, at the end of the day, life insurance has to make sense financially. Um, I mean, if 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 it's a rare situation where you know the premium commitment is is ridiculous, unlikely, but possible, um, then it's yeah, then it's do they do they buy as much insurance as they're willing to spend premium wise, or do they just uh, you know start a separate account and just you know start saving money in the event that that something happens? But there's different ways to approach it. Usually, rarely is there that much inequalities. On, on occasion, you'll see maybe like a like a father and a son, um, you know, where the dad has all the experience. He's significantly older. You know, maybe he's already had a significant health event. Uh, the son is the young go-getter, healthy, but has you know a, a boatload of things to learn to to where he could become proficient and actually run the business. So that's you know the purpose of you know, the, the insurance. Um, yeah, it's, again, it comes, it comes down to the math and, and what makes sense for the business to spend. Cause I mean, ultimately it's the business that's paying, uh, you know, paying for the insurance. No, I get that. So on the one hand, in certain situations, like you just described with a father and son, a, you don't necessarily expect parity in the expenditures. Mm -hmm. It's okay for the business to spend more on dad's life insurance premium because he's earned it because it's required because he's senior and his son is a junior partner okay um and as you also mentioned um the business also has to make sure that it's uh financially worthwhile and and and, and merited and maybe they want to help um subsidize the cost of the insurance with additional funds from somewhere and frankly, I've also seen a situation where um, they want a certain amount of parity. They accept that Mo is, is going to be cost more for the business to to insure Mo, and they make it up somewhere else. I you know I tell them go to your accountant, maybe end of your bonuses or you know whatever distribution they want to make at the end of the year can be tilted more in favor of Larry at the end of the year because the business has already spent more money on Mo's coverage type of thing meaning that there's there's a certain bag of tricks available to the accountant to compensate for spending more on one partner for life insurance than another yeah and a lot and a lot of times whether it's you know our our, our business owner clients or our individual clients um you know at the end of the day the the purpose of of any life insurance is is to avoid help help avoid you know a financially uh, catastrophic catastrophic event it isn't necessarily going to satisfy everything you would like it to. You know, if, if, you know, if we have a million dollars coming in, that's going to, you know, save our bacon, so to speak. Um, the, the, the numbers say we really should have 2 million. Um, but with a million, things are going to be okay. You know, we might have to juggle and, and do some different things and, you know, retool. Um, but that's okay. And it's the same thing with personal insurance. Somebody's like, well, how much should I have? Um, well, there's how much should I have and how much am I willing to spend? So that's always, you know, arriving at the amount of insurance for anybody, as you know, it's, you know, what, what feels right. You know, uh, you don't want to cringe. I always, uh, you know, tell people don't, 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 uh, say my name in vain. Every time you're writing that check for your <laughs> life insurance, that's not the point. The point is, um, you know, we'll get you the best rate guarantee, uh, you know, guarantee you we're going to find you the best rate that's out there. Um, but let's, 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 uh, you know, financial advisor here, let's, uh, let's make sure it makes sense financially budget. Right. I get that. Yeah. Two last questions. Let's suppose now we have Mo and Larry as business partners. And as you described, Mo owns the policy on Larry and Larry owns a policy on Mo. Mo just decides to retire and, um, they, you know, Larry buys him out and Mo goes his merry way. Can Larry still retain the policy on Mo, even though Mo's no longer his business partner? He actually could. I mean, uh, with any type of insurance, whoever's the designated owner of the policy controls the policy. Um, I mean, he probably wouldn't. They'd probably have some sort of agreement where 
they would change ownership um, to where he could keep the policy as a uh, you know personal policy. He could name his wife, his family as a beneficiary. Um, but in, in, in theory, if, if there was a reason, uh, once someone is the owner of the policy, they can you know keep that policy for as long as they see fit. I had that once. Three partners had policies on each other. One of them retired, and and one of the remaining active partners called me up and said, "Hey, can we still keep the money, this policy on so and so?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "Why would you?" He goes, "I just want it." Within the next year, the the, uh, the retired partner got pancreatic cancer. It it was very fast acting, and that company collected a boatload of money. Um, they were allowed to retain the policy on, on the retired partner. They did, and they collected. So, and they just made the decision it was worthwhile to keep paying the premium. So maybe they knew something I didn't in terms of the potential failing health of the retired partner, and they just kind of made it an investment, but they made off. All right, so one last question, Darren. Um, we've talked about this before. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of times the business owners don't necessarily aren't necessarily clear on what the exact need for life insurance is, and sometimes they end up really needing key person coverage as opposed to partnership agreement funding. Can you just explain briefly the difference between using life insurance to indemnify against the loss of a key person and using life insurance to fund a partnership agreement? My, uh, my internet keeps blinking in and out. I don't know if it's on my end or your end. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear. Oh, it says my internet's unstable, whatever that means. Um, yeah, so kind of as I let off, a lot of times, you know, we'll be approached by someone saying, well, I need, I need business insurance to protect the business. And, you know, once, once we peel back the layers a little bit, oftentimes what they're referring to is like a, a key person policy. Meaning, you know, the company would greatly suffer if, you know, maybe it's the, the top sales guy or the, the top engineer or the top, um, you know, the senior manager that has all the, the relationships for all the different sales contracts, whatever. Um, so, yeah, a lot of times something will start as, as, as buy sell in, in actuality ends up being a key person, which is similar. Uh, we just design it a little bit different in how the insurance companies justify the amount is based more on uh, the person's compensation versus, you know, they wouldn't even have to have uh, any type of equity ownership in the business. Got it. That's a good summary. And uh, I do know that's some... a, good, a good topic for another day. We could talk, you know, simply about key person. So yes, you're exactly right. That's what I was going to say. So we are going to have a feature on key person coverage in the upcoming months. Good. And having said that, that brings us to the end of today's educational seminar. Thank you once again, Darren. You have once again provided clarity on the world of life insurance and as it applies to business personal finance. And we can once again see the magic of this product. Thank you everybody for attending and we will see you next month. Have a good rest of the day. Good day.